So thank you all for joining us. We're going to probably wait about two minutes, uh, let other people join, and then we'll get started. All right, I think in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, this is another one of what we call our Tuesday night talks here at CND Life Sciences. Um, for the last few, we've actually brought in uh, guest speakers. And today we have uh, Dr. Kosla, who's with uh, Cala Health. Um, and I think this will be kind of an interesting talk today because we'll talk a little bit about what we do at CND Life Sciences in terms of helping diagnose uh, movement disorders and other disorders that we call synucleinopathies. And then Cal is gonna talk about a really exciting novel treatment for uh, essential tremor uh, that I think is gonna be a, a really helpful tool in all of our armamentarium as we approach these patients. So I'll try to talk for about 20 minutes. Uh, Dr. Kosal will talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll leave about 20 minutes for questions. Um, there's a chat function and a Q&A function on uh, the, the Zoom meeting. Uh, if possible, please enter the questions on the Q&A feature. Uh, that way we can tr track them a, a little bit better. Um, and as always, this is not intended to offer uh, personal um, medical information. So we'll try to keep this uh, on the scale of um, what, what providers would think about as they approach these disorders. So um, <clears throat> what we do at CND Life Sciences is focused very much on this protein that's called alpha-synuclein. And what's really emerged over the past three to five decades is the concept that this protein is very important uh, in understanding a number of different uh, neurologic diseases that are primarily what we call neurodegenerative. So diseases in which parts of the nervous system die uh, for reasons that we don't understand. In Parkinson's disease, we understand that this is due to the progressive degeneration of dopaminergic neur neurons in the substantia nigra. Um, the loss of these neurons relates very much to the severity of the patient's disease. And, and this particular structure here, the Lewy body, was one of the first described pathological hallmarks in the brains of patients that suffer from Parkinson's disease. We don't know what causes Parkinson's disease, and very likely there are many causes. So there are some genetic mutations that we know of that predict the risk of Parkinson's. Uh, there have been a number of environmental factors, um, all the way uh, back to MPTP as one of the big causes of a first induced form of Parkinsonism. Um, and all of this leads to a lot of different cellular dysfunction. So excitotoxicity, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, what I like to say is if a doctor puts a slide up that's got 20 different possible explanations, it means we don't know the right one. And, and that is the answer. We still don't know the right one. Alpha-synuclein, however, as I said, has been very important in understanding Parkinson's disease. It was the first genetic mutation that was found to uh, cause familial forms of Parkinson's disease in an autosomal dominant way. Um, we don't know the function of alpha-synuclein, but we do know that there are many different mutations in that protein and that they all can lead to uh, progressively worse forms of the disease. Some of the theories as to alpha-synuclein is um, related to its localization in the neuron. So alpha-synuclein seems to localize to the kind of presynaptic terminus where the synaptic vesicles are located. 
And so one of the theories is that it helps regulate how much dopamine is released by these neurons. So if you have too little alpha-synuclein, that can lead to too much release of the, neuron, of the excitotoxic uh, chemicals. And too much alpha-synuclein can then put a break on the release of these. So it may relate to how dopamine is released, but again, we're not really entirely sure. Um, as I said before, the Lewy body is probably the best recognized way to diagnose Parkinson's disease and to be certain of the diagnosis, but this requires either brain biopsy or autopsy. And what I'd like to kind of highlight on this slide, if you would focus on here, what we call the Lewy neurite. And this is where alpha-synuclein can be seen in the extensions, not in the cell body of, of these neurons, but in the neurites themselves. And the reason I want you to kind of keep that picture in mind is I'm gonna show you how we can actually see a very similar picture without the need of autopsies or brain biopsies. Let's see, okay. Now, one of the really fascinating things about Parkinson's disease is the fact that it is not just a brain disease. Um, it is present that the changes of Parkinson's disease are present throughout the body. So if we look at post-mortem studies, there have been a number of structures all throughout the body in which we see alpha-synuclein uh, accumulating inside the neurons causing neurodegeneration. And even in living patients now, we have studies showing that you can see it in salivary glands, in the submandibular gland, in the stomach, the colon, the skin, and people are trying to find it in spinal fluid, plasma, and even tears. So this seems to be much more of a systemic process in Parkinson's disease than you might expect just from uh, the, the uh, neurologic uh, side effects that people develop. So one of the things that's also become clear about Parkinson's disease is that it takes many, many years for this disease to develop. And so there's this whole concept now of what we call prodromal symptoms, symptoms that occur long before the person has motor symptoms. So for example, 90% of Parkinson's patients lose their sense of smell before motor symptoms. Um, about 30 to 40% of patients may have REM sleep behavior disorder. There is a much higher incidence of unexplained constipation in men who develop uh, Parkinson's disease. Likewise, there's depression. And so there's this whole concept that these symptoms really start to develop 10 or 20 years before. And what's become clear is that we can now start to identify the accumulation of the alpha-synuclein even as much as 10 or 20 years before the motor symptoms begin. The challenge is that the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is not that great. So we think it's very simple. Um, we think it's a patient with an asymmetric rest tremor, they shuffle, they have bradykinesia, gait instability, we give them dopamine, they get better. We think, oh, that's Parkinson's disease. But it turns out when you do autopsy studies and you look at patients that have been diagnosed with probable or, or definite Parkinson's disease, between 20 and 30% of those patients are misdiagnosed, meaning they don't have Lewy bodies when they come to autopsy. Um, and in fact, many other conditions can kind of confuse them. So if they've had shoulder bursitis, maybe that's why the arm doesn't move. What if they've had previous strokes and that's where the rigidity comes from? Um, and so all of this can lead to lots of unnecessary testing. The worst case is it probably leads to lots of unnecessary ineffective treatments. Um, and this can make the patient's quality of life significantly worse. So many groups have tried to say, is there a reliable way to see alpha-synuclein in the skin as an indicator that the person has a synucleinopathy? Um, and so that's really where um, a number of these studies have come from, either looking at prodromal patients or patients that have uh, already established disease. So what we did at CND Life Sciences was really to start to use a technique that's been around for about 15 to 20 years now, that of taking a small little skin biopsy, and you can see the picture on the right, how small the piece of skin is that we have to remove, and then looking inside the nerves to see if we can find the pathologic form of the protein. So we all have alpha-synuclein, that's what makes our nerves work. But in people with Parkinson's disease, they phosphorylate the alpha-synuclein, and that leads to progressive accumulation of that protein. So if you look at the top screen, these are two different nerve bundles, and that red stain running along the length of that nerve is the phosphorylated synuclein inside that neuron. Now down here, the green is actually staining for all of the nerves in that nerve bundle. So you can see that the phosphorylated synuclein is not in all of the nerves but you can also see how it runs long longitudinally along the length of the nerve. 
And this is what we can identify in the skin. So we launched this about three years ago. We have neurologists in about 40 plus states now that are using the test and they're helping, uh, the test is helping the neurologist to diagnose patients that have these synucleinopathies. So, so Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, multiple system atrophy, pure autonomic failure or REM sleep behavior disorder. So the first question is, well, how good is the test? So we and other groups believe that the test is very sensitive and very specific. So this was our internal data um, using patients with Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, dementia with Lewy bodies, and pure autonomic failure. And our ability to detect the pathological form of the protein in those patients is greater than 95%. So the sensitivity is very high. But more important than that is the specificity. So here with healthy controls and disease controls, and the disease controls were essential tremor patients or Alzheimer's patients. There, we never saw the pathological form of the protein, indicating that the specificity approaches 100%. Now, this was published last year by a different group. This was a group in Italy, and they used the same methodology, the immunofluorescence of the skin, and they found their sensitivity for detecting synucleinopathies was 90%, but again, their specificity was 100%. And they compared that to another technique, which is starting to be used these days called RT-Quick, which allows us to look at how the protein misfolds other proteins. And so using skin as the seed for RT-Quick, you can see the sensitivity and the specificity in their hands was not as good as the immunofluorescence. But using CSF, it was basically just as good. The difference being that the immunofluorescence of the skin is a much easier technique than having to put your patients through a spinal tap. To get to that degree of sensitivity and specificity, we take three pieces of skin. So one from the ankle, one from the knee, and one from behind the neck. Um, the nice thing about this test is that it's paid for by Medicare and by most uh, commercial payers right now. Um, we, you take the biopsies in your offices, you ship them to us at room temperature. It's a very simple process. The in-lab staining process is about eight to 10 days. So by the time it's shipped, we process it, we read it, we issue the report, we say about three weeks. Now, some people will say, well, why do the SIN1 test if I can do a DAT scan? So the first is we're actually seeing the pathological protein that's driving the patient's disease. So how is that significant? Well, that would be significant, for example, in a patient that had a cortical basal syndrome uh, uh, where the DAT scan might be abnormal, but that's due to a tauopathy, not a synucleinopathy. Um, it's a, we're also much less expensive than the DAT scan. We're much easier. So if you've ever asked a patient who's gotten a DAT scan how long it took at the imaging facility, it's about a five to six hour process, during which time many of them may have to be off of some of their medications and they don't have to get to a nuclear medicine facility. So it's a much easier process. As the physician, you would bill for doing the procedure. It takes about 15 minutes to do the procedure in your office. Uh, the typical Medicare reimbursement right now for that 15 minutes is about 300 to $350 or about 3.1 RVUs. They can be done by PAs or NPs. The report we give back is relatively straightforward. Uh, so we tell you whether or not there is phosphorylated alpha synuclein. If the pathologic form of the protein is there, that is diagnostic of a synucleinopathy. We also look for the intraepidermal nerve fiber density. And the reason we do that is that it allows us to help try to distinguish between the synucleinopathies. So if, the, if phosphorylated synuclein is there, again, that's black and white. It's synucleinopathy. If it's not there, it's not a synucleinopathy. But then in the group of synucleinopathies, let's say you're trying to distinguish between Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy, about 80% of patients with Parkinson's disease will also have a small fiber neuropathy, much less commonly in MSA. So a, a patient like this would favor Parkinson's disease over the other synucleinopathies. We also look for amyloid, and then we do a routine H&E. Um, we give you pictures of your, your patient's actual pathology so you can review them with your patients as well. So how does that work in, in sort of day-to-day -day practice for, for neurologists and, and doctors that are using this task? So the, the first point that I make is if you see a patient who has uh, you know, an intention tremor that's eight to 10 hertz, they have trouble writing, they have trouble drinking, uh, you give them a beta blocker and they get better, um, well, that's probably going to be essential tremor and I don't think you need a test. Um, likewise, if they do shuffle and have an asymmetric rest tremor and you give them Cinemat and they get better, you probably have the answer, you don't need a test. 
But about 20% of the time, the patient's response to the initial treatment is not going to be what you expect. And you're going to start to question, am I sure? What if they have two diseases? What if they have Parkinson's disease and essential tremor? How can I start to piece that together? And so here is where the test is helpful, because if you're trying to decide between those diseases and you do the SIN1 test and the SIN1 test is abnormal, that tells you that your patient has a synucleinopathy, so Parkinson's disease, DLB, or MSA. If it's normal, then it's going to be much more likely up here. So I'll give you a couple of examples of this. There was a very good movement disorder doctor in, in the Northwest. Um, they saw a patient um, that they thought had MSAC. Uh, they sent in the biopsy. The biopsy was normal. Um, the, patient, the doctor called us and said, that's really strange. I really thought this was MSA. We said, all right, well, we'll, we'll run it again. So cut new sections, run it again, still normal. Um, talked to the doctor again, and we said, you know, have you ruled out the possibility that the spinal cerebellar ataxia? Um, and so then they went and did genetic testing, and sure enough, they had genetically confirmed SCA. So these are very difficult diagnoses. If you're trying to distinguish progressive supranuclear palsy from Parkinson's disease, this can be very helpful because PSP is going to be abnormal on the DAT scan, um, but will not be a synucleinopathy. And again, I think essential tremor from Parkinson's disease, this is very helpful in discriminating between those two, or even telling you that both may be present. In the cognitive sphere, um, this can be useful early in the course of patients' dementias to say, does this look more like dementia with Lewy bodies or does this look more like Alzheimer's disease? Those things can be very important in terms of prognosis for the patient and the family, and also what medications you might want to avoid. So obviously, if it's a DLB patient, trying to avoid the typical antipsychotics is going to be essential, whereas if it's an Alzheimer's patient, it may not be as essential. In the autonomic world, um, where most of these synucleinopathies have autonomic dysfunction, we're finding more and more patients that maybe just had a few years of diabetes and then began to develop a severe autonomic neuropathy. Unusual in the beginning of diabetes to have the autonomic nerves go. Late, diabetes is the most common cause. So then we do the biopsies, we find the biopsy is abnormal and the patient has diabetes with a synucleinopathy. And then the last group, I think, which is really, really interesting is the REM behavior disorder group. So here we know that patients with REM behavior disorder, about 80% of them over 10 years will go on to develop either Parkinson's, Lewy body, or MSA. Um, but there are other causes of REM behavior disorder. Some of the forms of narcolepsy can cause REM behavior disorder. There are other parasomnias that may be mistaken for REM behavior disorder. So if you diagnose your patient with REM behavior disorder and they go home and read about it, they're going to get really scared about what's coming down the road. If we do the biopsy and the biopsy is normal, it's going to really kind of provide some reassurance that this is not RBD that is prodromal to one of the synucleinopathies, but may just be isolated RBD or related to other conditions. So it's really that kind of discrimination, that clarity, I think that people have been really um, benefiting from uh, in ordering uh, the, the SIN1 test. So I'm going to stop there. Again, if you have any questions, um, please type them into the Q&A, and uh, Dr. Kosla and I will answer them at the end. But I'm going to introduce Dr. Kosla, who will tell us a little bit about herself and, and Cala Health. Um, but I've just been really impressed with what they're doing, um, with the idea that so many of our older folks uh, with essential tremor have so much difficulty tolerating the medications. And I think this is an incredible tool to have in our armamentarium. So I was excited that they would come and talk about that today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Dr. Levine, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dara Kosla. I'm a neurologist with fellowship training in neuromuscular disease. Um, after fellowship, I went into community neurology practice in the San Francisco Bay Area and a practice for about 13 years. And uh, about five years ago, I began to consult at Cala Health uh, and worked on some of their clinical studies. Uh, I found that their technology is really exciting. So over a year ago now, I came on board full time as their medical director. And I'm really happy to be here today representing all the fantastic people who work at Cala and to share with you what we've been working on. Uh, next slide. So today I'm going to cover the disease burden and unmet need in the treatment of essential tremor. I'll talk about TAPS or transcutaneous afferent patterned stimulation. 
I'll cover the clinical data with regards to efficacy and then end with how to order a device for patients. Next slide. Now we all know that essential trauma is a progressive movement disorder where there's involuntary rhythmic movement. This rhythmic movement is typically seen in the hands as well as in the head, the trunk and other parts of the body. Essential tremor was previously thought to be benign, but now we know it's not so benign, right? It can be very disabling. It can severely impact a person's ability to eat, drink, take care of themselves, uh, and perform essential activities of daily living. All the simple things that we all do every day, but the things that we might all take for granted. Uh, we know that essential tremor patients have higher rates of comorbidities. Um, they have embarrassment due to tremor. It leads to social isolation. There are higher rates of anxiety and depression as well as greater rates of alcoholism, which you know, could be due to self-treatment of their tremor with alcohol. Um, and healthcare economics data uh, just recent, recently published show that ET patients have a higher cost of care as compared to non-essential tremor patients. Next slide, please. So ET is not so benign as we used to think, uh, but unfortunately the current standard of care for ET is not sufficient. Propranolol and primidone are the first line pharmacotherapies, but Side effects like bradykinesia, depression, sedation can all lead to discontinuation rates, which are up to 35%. And of those patients who can actually tolerate these drugs, 30 to 60% have any reduction in tremor, and those who do respond see about a 30 to 50% reduction in their tremor. The other options available to patients are invasive, right? There's deep brain stimulation, there's MR-guided focused ultrasound, and whereas the invasive options can provide better tremor reduction, they come with potential adverse events and surgical risks. So a lot of patients are just hesitant to undergo brain surgery like DBS or undergo an irreversible thalamic procedure in the case of focused ultrasound. We'll see only less than 3% of ET patients actually undergo uh, these procedures. So there's a gap in the current standard of care where pharmacotherapy is poorly tolerated uh, and maybe not very effective, and invasive options come with great potential risk. So calataps therapy, um, which I will describe in um, a little bit more detail, is able to fill this gap. It's non-invasive, non-pharmacological. The International Essential Tremor Foundation includes TAPS therapy as an add-on or a follow-up to first-line therapy in their treatment recommendations. And uh, I'll go into the clinical trial data and discuss eff efficacy a little bit later on. But I just wanted to point out here that as opposed to pharmacotherapy and invasive procedures, the adverse event rate in the clinical studies with TAPS um, was low and, and the adverse events were really localized and mild. Uh, next slide, please. So very quickly, um, I'll give you an introduction to Cala Health and the device itself. So Cala Health is a medical device startup company. It was spun out of Stanford University's biodesign program, and the company has developed this first-in-class non-invasive neuromodulation therapy for essential tremor. Next slide. And the Cala device is cleared by the FDA for ET. It delivers a therapy called TAPS, which stands for transcutaneous, so across the skin, afferent, going from the hand to the brain, pattern stimulation, right? That's the way that it delivers the electrical stim. Each therapy with a Cala device lasts 40 minutes long, each therapy session. And the three components of the Cala system are the following. There's a stimulator, a band, and a charging base station. So the stimulator has these onboard, uh, it, it has an onboard accelerometer, and that accelerometer measures a patient's tremor, calibrates therapy to that patient's individual tremor frequency, and then delivers electrical stimulation to the patient. And the stim is transcutaneously delivered by the band to the median and the radial nerves. And the band on, on the inside part um, has proprietary dry electrodes, and uh, these bands do need to be replaced every three months for optimal functioning. Um, the 
charging base station is cloud connected. It not only charges the device, but also uploads data from the simulator, which can be analyzed and used to understand the magnitude of tremor improvement for that patient. So we're getting objective data out of that. Uh, next slide, please. So it's believed that tremor is produced by pathologic oscillatory firing in the brain and the VIM or the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus is a key relay point in this network. The VIM is the target for deep brain stimulation and MR guided focused ultrasound. And calitaps therapy also targets the VIM, but it does so non-invasively via the peripheral nerves. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the, oh, next slide, please, sorry. And as I mentioned earlier, the device has onboard sensors which allow it to sense a patient's tremor, calibrate to that frequency, and apply electrical stim to the median and radial nerves in an out of phase manner, which ultimately restores normal firing in the brain. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just an overview of uh, the published clinical data. So there were two randomized controlled clinical studies that led to the FDA clearance for use in essential tremor of the hand. And I'll re review those studies next. Um, there was also a small study to look at how long the effect of therapy lasts. And this study found that tremor is improved for at least 60 minutes after the end of a therapy session. Then an open label single arm study was conducted. It was the largest study in ET, and I'll review those results of that study as well. And we have a publication on real world evidence uh, on the efficacy and safety in the real world. And that has been accepted at a peer reviewed journal and we are just awaiting publication. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there were two randomized controlled trials that led to the FDA clearance. Um, in all the studies, we used gold standard assessments to understand efficacy of therapy. Uh, so many of you are, are probably familiar with Tetris, the Tremor Research Group Essential Tremor Rating Scale, where the physician rates a patient's tremor, and the Bain and Finley Activities of Daily Living Scale, where the patients rate their ability to perform activities of daily living. Um, and in these first two studies, um, as I mentioned, they were randomized controlled trials. The first uh, double-blinded study is depicted on, on the left side here. The treatment arm had 10 patients and the sham or placebo arm had 13 patients. Efficacy was measured as a change in the Archimedes uh, spiral rating from the Tetris scale. And you'll notice a uh, there's a noticeable difference between the spiral before and after therapy in the treatment patient as compared to the sham arm. The second randomized control trial found significant improvement in physician-rated Tetra scores and patient-rated Bain and Finley scores when the treatment group was compared with the sham. Next slide. And then in 2020, uh, Prospect was published. It was a prospective home use study. It was the largest study in essential tremor with 263 patients enrolled across 26 sites. The patients were seen at three in-person office visits. They had a therapy session, a 40-minute therapy session during each in-person office visit. And in between the office visits, they were instructed to take the device home and use the device twice a day. So at the end of the study, a total number of at-home sessions that were recorded was over 21,000 sessions. Next slide, please. So we learned some interesting things. Right? We um, we learned that patients improved in their Tetris scores and their Bain and Finley activities of daily living scores within each clinic visit, each time they did a therapy session in clinic. We also found that patients improved in Tetris and ADLs from baseline pre-visit one to study completion post therapy session at visit three. But we also found that the Tetris and ADL scores improved between pre-stimulation at visit one to pre-stimulation at visit three at month three. So this shows that with repeated use, there can be improvement in a patient's baseline tremor, um, implying a, a cumulative effect and you know, potentially some sort of neuroplasticity. Uh, next slide, please. 
So here's just a histogram uh, from that study. A, each line represents a patient and it plots the patient's median improvement in tremor power across all sessions. So this is the actual recording um, from the devices. And the key takeaways here are that overall 92% of patients in the study had improved tremor power, at least some improvement in their tremor power as measured by the device. And 54% of patients improved by at least 50%. And 25% of patients improved by at least 70%, which actually comes close to, to efficacy that we see with surgical therapies. Um, and now that the therapy has actually been on market since 2019, we've collected real world evidence on usage and efficacy. And as I said, that um, we're just waiting on publication for that. Uh, next slide. So I'd like to quickly show you how a Calatrio device is prescribed. Um, one important thing to note is that there is a 60 day no obligation trial period. Um, so your patient can try it, use it for a few weeks, and if it doesn't work for them, they can return it. Um, also, if you work at a VA hospital or if your patient is a veteran, the VA actually provides calotherapy uh, to veterans to treat their ET. Um, otherwise, prescription pads are either provided to the doctor's offices, or you can go to the website, calatrio.com. You can download a prescription form. And prescribing is really simple. Just need three pieces of information. You just need to choose whether you're treating the left hand or the right hand. Uh, you need to choose the postural hold that brings out their tremor, uh, the where their tremor is worse. So either the lateral or the outstretched postural hold because that's actually the hole they're going to do when they calibrate the device. Um, and third, you just need to measure the patient's wrist size. So you're going to measure it, write it down in centimeters or inches, and then, of course, send chart notes, uh, medical necessity documentation, insurance information, demographics, and all that stuff. And it goes right to Cala. And um, next slide. Cala Health basically ships the device directly to the patient. Once the patient receives the device, they're, they've, they get help with setup, calibration, um, and they use the device on an as-needed basis at home. They perform 40-minute stim sessions when they want to have relief from their tremors, when they, when they feel like they would need it. Um, and there is a patient portal now, so patients can access their usage, their, their efficacy data. Um, they can download it, print it out, bring it to their next office visit to review with their neurologist um, in case there's you know, a chance to change management based on that. Um, and of course, we have a great customer success team. They're available to answer device-related questions. So um, you know, basically, they, they've kept it really simple and straightforward so that there's reduced burden on the physician and the physician staff. Um, Next slide. I think that's it for me. Um, if you have Great. any questions, mm -hmm. that's my contact information. There's information for customer success and the website, and similarly for CND Life Sciences. Great. Um, so again, if you have any questions uh, for either Dr. Kosa or me, uh, please um, put them into the Q and A section. Uh, I think we also have a couple of polls uh, that will. Uh, just going to ask you if you're interested in the information. Um, let's see. Okay, first question here. Uh, what labs would you advise a neurologist uh, to run for small fiber neuropathy? Um, so it, it's a good question, and it really sort of depends how, how advanced you're, you want to go. So most small fiber neuropathy are either pre-diabetic or idiopathic, and that's probably about 75 or 80 percent of them. Um, typically, if you want to go one step further than that, you know, looking at B12 and looking for a pair of protein makes a lot of sense. Um, beyond that, you know, looking for Sjogren syndrome and some of the autoimmune diseases, I think people will do I think a lot of the autoantibody panels that people have used in the past really have a lot of false positives, and I'm not sure there's any clear correlation between those panels and small fiber neuropathy. So I think, you know, looking for glucose, B12, pear protein, Sjogren's is really probably about all we need to do. Now, if it's much more aggressive than that, then you're going to want to be, you know, more aggressive and think about other tests. But 
Um, for the most part, that's really probably all we really need to do. Um, I'll kind of skip back and forth here a little bit. Uh, so Dr. Kosla says for TAPS, yeah. is there a maximum amount of times they can do the therapy in a 24 hour period? Uh, yeah, so um, from a, you know, from a battery standpoint, uh, the a full charge can last about five therapy sessions. Um, we, in our clinical studies, we ask patients to do a session twice a day. Um, what we're seeing in the real world is that patients are going to do it really on an as-needed basis, right? So if they um, have an activity that they do a couple times a day, uh, or if they need it for meals, really, they'll do it right before a meal. Um, but if someone's just using it, say, you know, I, I had a patient... Um, used to play the trombone and so if they if they just want to use it right right before they play their instrument maybe that's when they're going to do it so it really varies um in the real world setting they can they can get they can do as many as they want um but yeah a single charge holds uh, about five um what do they have to do during a tap session yeah so the first the first 20 seconds they're going to actually hold their hands in one of these positions that's when the device is measuring their tremor um, for the rest of the 40 minutes as long as they're not you know moving their wrist around very aggressively because that might um, get the band disconnected and and interrupt therapy they really can go about doing anything um they just you know don't submerge it in water and you know dive into your swimming pool but outside yeah. of that you can do anything you want. Yeah, probably smart um okay so there's another question about the um using the intraepidermal nerve fiber density in the sin one test for differentiating between the diseases so um i'm going to hedge on that answer because we are at the tail end of a three-year nih sponsored study uh which should end i think look, looks like december 1st we'll finish enrollment of 400 patients and one of the purposes of that study is really to say in addition to looking for the phosphorylated synuclein, what other features of the biopsy help us distinguish between the diseases? We believe right now that the presence of a small fiber neuropathy is one of those, so it can help push towards Parkinson's, for example. Um, but it also might be true that where the uh, synuclein is found in those three biopsies, what structures, is it in the autonomic structures, is it in the, the subepidermal plexus, is it on the blood vessels? So we're really looking at all of that. And I would say we hope to have, you know, one or two publications in 23 that really kind of speaks to that. In the short run, uh, we do not put that in our report yet because we don't have the data, but we are very happy if you get reports back and you want to call us, we can look at the report with you live, you know, over Zoom for five minutes and just say, look, we, we can't be sure, but this is favoring X or favoring Y. So we do think the neuronal degeneration of the small nerves may be a very important feature. Um, and then uh, the other question here was, what are inappropriate reasons that people have done the test? Uh, <laughs> um, so I don't know that I can answer that too well. Um, I'm sure there might be some out there, you know, we, we, we do many tests, but, the, the, the real reasons, again, I think are if you're thinking about a patient with one of those disease types, so one of the dementias, one of the movement disorders, one of the autonomic disorders, um, and, and maybe one of the sleep disorders, and you're not certain about your diagnosis. So this is not a test for everybody with a tremor. Most people with a tremor, 70, 80 percent, you're going to be right with your clinical diagnosis. But when something just doesn't feel right, um, for example, we're doing a, a, a pilot study now with a Jankovic's group. He's been a big believer in what he calls essential tremor plus. So that's essential tremor people. They look just like essential tremor people when they start, um, but then they start to develop some of the Parkinsonian features. So, so what is that? Is that just that essential tremor is common? And sometimes those people also get Parkinson's disease. Is it two different things? And so we're trying to really look into that. So I think as long as you feel like you are in that circle with those groups of diseases that you need some additional help. So again, if you might say to yourself, would I get a DAT scan to help distinguish this early dementia patient and see is it DLB or is it Alzheimer's disease? 
this is a cheaper, easier way and probably more sensitive way to get that information. So I hope that helps. Um, let's see, I think we have a couple of other ones. Um, okay, a couple of other ones about SIN 1. So asking whether academic centers are using it. Yes, and in fact, so I didn't realize that Cala and, and CND launched both in 2019, right when COVID hit. So that was great. Um, but uh, we thought um, that the test would be used more by community practice neurologists. And our thinking was community practice neurologists are not that familiar with movement disorders. They haven't done the movement disorder fellowship or they haven't done a cognitive disorder fellowship. And therefore they might like to use this test more often Whereas the academic center people, well, they're really smart and they don't need ancillary tests like DAT scans or the SIN1 test as often. We've actually been proven very wrong about that. And the reason is if you're in a community practice and you think something's essential tremor and you give them the CALA device and they get better, you're right and you're done, right? But it's the person that you think has essential tremor who doesn't get better that you're gonna send to the academic center. So the academic centers are seeing all the ones that are really confusing. So. For example, I was called yesterday by a very prominent academic center who had used our test on a patient who uh, had an asymmetric rest tremor on and off response to dopamine for three years. And then for the next two years, just became terribly unresponsive, started to evolve all kinds of other symptoms. They did DBS, no response to DBS. The patient continued to get worse. Uh, and they were concerned that the patient had a cortical basal syndrome did the test. Now, the test came back abnormal, meaning that the patient did have Parkinson's and that that first three years of on-off response probably did reflect a synucleinopathy, but now they're probably developing a second disease. And we know that many of these neurodegenerative diseases have co-pathologies. Um, so those are very confusing cases. And so about half of our tests are ordered from Stanford, Duke, UT Southwestern, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, you know, you name it, um, because they're they're seeing these very complicated tests or patients. Uh, Dr. Koster, there's one at the bottom there, and if you can see that uh, about intentional hand yes. tremor. PD. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so um, we are currently not indicated for Parkinson's disease. Uh, we did receive a breakthrough designation from the FDA, um, and we are studying the effects of calotherapy on Parkinson's disease patients. Um, I can tell you that we presented a poster at the American Academy of Neurology uh, in Seattle earlier this year. Um, it was a small study, N of 40, uh, but we saw about 80% of patients had an improvement in uh, action tremor uh, sorry, 80% of patients had at least 50% improvement in their action tremor, um, but there's more work to be done. Um, so currently we're not indicated, but we're working on it. Great. Um, and then two questions, yeah, uh, about how early the SIN1 test can pick things up. And so the answer is we don't know. I mean, that would take very long longitudinal studies, but I can give you some data that argues it's pretty far, it's pretty early. So there's a very nice paper done, um, I think it was 2019, where they took REM behavior disorder patients, which would be the best characterized prodromal disease state. Um, and they took RBD patients, but it was due to uh, narcolepsy type one. And they did, they did many, many things on these patients, but this, including DAT scans and everything else. But the single most statistically different difference between an RBD patient who was gonna develop a synucleinopathy and an RBD patient uh, secondary to uh, narcolepsy type one was the presence of phosphorylated synuclein in the skin. And they found it in 80% of the RBD patients. Now, some other studies have been a little lower, closer to 60%. Um, so it's probably 60 to 80% of the patients can be detected, uh, you know, five to 10 years before motor symptoms. I like to tell a story, one of my patients, cause it just was amazing to me early on when we started doing the SIN1 test, I had this patient, a uh, 50 year old guy who for about three years had seen every neurologist you could imagine. And his complaint was that his legs were weak. And unlike Dr. Kosal, I'm not a movement disorder doctor, actually, I'm a, a neuromuscular doctor. 
So came to see me, he had had every test done, uh, including a muscle biopsy and everything was normal. And all he could say is my legs are weak, my legs are weak. So now I had the advantage of seeing him three years later, but when I looked at him, he looked bradykinetic to me. So I did the skin biopsy, the skin biopsy was abnormal, put him on Cinemat and he called me within two weeks and said that for the first time in three years, he could walk through the grocery store with his wife. So he was clearly prodromal. He couldn't express what was wrong with his legs. <laughs> he just knew his legs weren't doing what he wanted them to do. So it, it's a very fun test in that kind of early, nobody can quite figure out what the symptoms are because I think the prodromal, I mean, you can comment on it too, Dr. Kosla, but I think the prodromal symptoms of these patients often can be confusing. I don't know if you've had that experience. Yeah, absolutely. I've had it. And I'm neuromuscular as well. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I thought you were a movement disorder. <laughs> all right. All right. What are we talking about this for them? Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So again, a, a question about whether the SIN1 test could be used if patients have um, Parkinsonism uh, associated with the use of antipsychotics. Um, and so this is very helpful in that group of patients. Um, because the patients that have drug-induced Parkinsonism will not have phosphorylated synuclein, um, and therefore it would be normal. Um, and again, some of those patients that have gotten, you know, antipsychotics, you know, maybe not, not tons, they're not schizophrenics, but they got it for some reason previously in their life, um, you know, doctors may have a tendency then just to blame it on the drugs, but if you do the test and the test is abnormal, well, no, people who got antipsychotics sometimes also get Parkinson's, <laughs> right? And so that, that can tell us that you might want to try to treat this person uh, for their underlying Parkinsonism as opposed to just blaming it on the drugs. So another one that's come up twice this week um, by other doctors, which again, I don't exactly have the answer to, but I have my suspicion, uh, is what about post-traumatic Parkinsonism? Now, we've never studied that, but I would think it would be the same way, where post-traumatic Parkinsonism would not have peripheral alpha-synuclein, and so the SIN1 test would be, a, would be normal, whereas if someone had a lot of trauma um, but then developed Parkinson's disease, then the SIN1 test would be abnormal. So it's kind of weird that that came up twice just in this one week. Uh, let's see, I think I answered all of those. Yeah, I think so. Uh, any other questions? Great. All right. Oh, Dr. Kosa. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, what about pharma trials using SIN1? We're involved with many pharma trials right now. Um, there's two reasons you might think that the SIN1 test would help pharma trials. The first is if you believe the autopsy data, then 30% of the people diagnosed with Parkinson's or MSA or DLB don't really have that disease. And so if you put those people into your trials, um, it's going to be very difficult to ever hit statistical significance. So we, we talk about patient homogeneity. And then we have, I think, three ongoing trials and another three that are just getting ready to start right now where we're helping define that um, patient homogeneity. The longer goal would be. Uh, can you show a change in the phosphorylated synuclein with treatment? So what we call target engagement. The challenge there, I, I'm not sure we'll be able to do that in all honesty, because if you think about it, we said you can detect it in the prodromal state. So that means that phosphorylated synuclein is accumulating over 10, maybe 20 or 30 years or 40 years before that person gets into the trial, because they're going to have been symptomatic for a long time before they get into the trial. And now you do a drug trial that's six months long and you say, can you get rid of that protein? Probably not that likely. I mean, that would be the Nobel prize for somebody if they figure out how to do that. But um, I think more is gonna be kind of the patient homogeneity story, so. That's great. All right, well, I think we will let everybody get back to their evenings. Um, Dr. Kosla, again, thank you so much. Um, We've got our websites and our contact information here. So if anybody would like to try the Calatrio or just get some more information, uh, email uh, one of those two places. And the same with the SIN1 test, email us at uh, CND Life Sciences. And I, I'm sure Dr. Kosa would agree, but if you have any questions, you know, reach out at any time, so. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks so much for having me here.
All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Good night.